What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. Pascal Siakam headed to the Indiana Pacers. Bruce Brown is the trade piece going back from the standpoint of salary filler. And then there's three first round picks in the deal. That said, I absolutely love this deal for Indiana on a couple of different fronts. First of all, the two first round picks that are coming from Indiana that were Indiana's own picks, Indiana's going to be good. Like, they're going to be a mid to late round first, uh, late to mid to late first round pick. Those are picks that have a significantly higher miss rate, right? So like like that part. And then I guess the third pick is the worst out of OKC, the Clippers, the Jazz, and the Rockets. Like that's probably going to end up being OKC's pick. So that's another late first rounder. So basically three most likely mid to late first rounders and Bruce Brown who's a good player. Bruce Brown's a good player, and we're going to talk about him in a little bit because I wouldn't be surprised if he gets traded again or if uh, um, if they end up moving a different one of those guys because uh, the Raptors have a bunch of players at that position. But that was the pos- position that the Pacers were in. They have so many guards. Tyrese Halliburton, Buddy Heald, Ben Matherin, TJ McConnell, Andrew Nemhard, Aaron Neesmith kind of can function as a two as well. It does a lot of the same stuff Bruce Brown does. So, like, literally... They just had a, a redundancy at that position. That does, that's not to say Bruce Brown's not good or not valuable, but he's less valuable to the Pacers than Pascal Siakam is to the Pacers, right? Obviously, not to mention Pascal's just a much better player. But specifically, Pascal's an awesome basketball fit with the Pacers. And I want to dive into that concept for a little bit. Let's start on the offensive end of the floor. So as I've said so many times on the show, I think Tyrese Halliburton is a transcendently great offensive engine. I think he's on that trajectory with the Steph Currys, the Nikola Jokic's, the Luka, the, the Luka Doncic's, the singularly transcendent offensive engines that you just put out on the floor and it's like a guaranteed great shot, like 90% of the possessions that he's on the floor, right? Well, Pascal Siakam helps him both on and off the ball. I want to start on the ball first, and in this case meaning when Pascal Siakam has the ball. He gives an additional type of offensive shot creation. Once you go past that, like a lot of the guys on the Pacers are good advantage extenders. Like Miles Turner can hit pick and pop jump shots and he can attack closeouts and things along those lines, but he's not a guy you're just going to dump the ball to and have him be an offensive engine. Obi Toppin is almost entirely a transition run out guy and a backdoor cutter, right? Like that's pretty much what Obi Toppin did in this off- offense. But he healed a lot of ghost screens going to the three point line. He's expecting to get set up with high quality shots. There really isn't another guy on the roster who's a high level individual shot creator. Not only is Siakam that, he's a very different version of that. Halliburton is very much like, he can beat switches, he's a great ISO player, but he's very much like a manipulator of the defense to generate advantage situations for other players. That's his best trait. He's a great pull-up shooter, really quick guard with an excellent floater and great touch around the rim with his like scooping layups and things like that. So I don't want to act like I'm, I don't want you guys to think that I'm underplaying how good Tyrese is as an on-ball scorer, but his best trait is his ability to set up uh, people with advantage situations, right? Well, Pascal Siakam is much more of that classic mismatch attacking forward, right? Um, Posting up. The, there are uh, he's getting 1.12 points per possession in post-up situations, including passes. Among all the players in the league who have done it at least 150 times, only Joel Embiid, Nikola Jokic, and Anthony Davis have been better. So he's literally been one of the very best post-up shot creators in the league this year. The best. That's not one of the three Titan centers that we have in the league, right? Isolation situation. Siakam gets 1.08 points per possession. That's 12th out of 50 players in the league who have run at least 75. And then a lot of talk about the jump shot with Pascal Siakam. And don't get me wrong, it's not good, but it's not really all that bad either. Like he's 55% on in effective field goal percentage on unguarded catch and shoots. It's really not that bad. That's 1.09 points per shot. Like, so if some team decides to leave him open, like he's going to be able to make him at a decent enough clip, right? That's not a, that's not a shot that's going to necessarily hurt your offense. And he's a solid closeout attacker. It gets 1.01 points per spot up possession. That's firmly in the middle. That's firmly average. So again, it's, it's appropriate to bring it up in the sense that he's not a flamethrower, But he's not a guy that's necessarily going to hurt you with his lack of shooting either. But where I'm most excited with Siakam on the Pacers is off the ball. 
Pascal Siakam is one of the very best transition players in the NBA. He's made 78 field goals this year in transition. That's the ninth most in the entire NBA. And like we all know, Tyrese is an excellent kick-ahead passer. He's constantly, that's how Obi Toppin, Obi Toppin is basically made himself a functional starter for the Pacers based purely on the fact that he's a good cutter and a good a good a guy that can run out and transition, right? And that he can, provides real vertical spacing, right? That That's something Siakam's going to come in and do right away at a really high level. Also a very good cutter. Scored on a cut 34 times so far this season. It's like the 32nd most in the NBA, I think, which is definitely a lot, right? Like, uh, not one of the top cutters in the league, but a very good cutter. He's also set 82nd percentile for efficiency cutting. And again, with Tyrese Halliburton, Running your lane in transition, cutting with real vertical spacing out of the weak side corner. These are things that are highly, highly valuable alongside a passer of his caliber. It's another form of spacing when you combine that with the pretty solid unguarded catch and shoot shooting. I don't think he's going to be a bad off player for them at all. That's it. We haven't even got to the defensive end of the floor. This is a team that severely lacked an interior physicality in defense, right? Miles Turner's a really, really good defensive player as, as like a shot blocker, right? And he can do a little switching as well. The thing with Miles, though, is what we've seen around the league is like it's no longer protecting the rim with your one guy. Like it's that four five is so important. And the main reason why is as pull up jump shooting has gotten become more and more prevalent in the league, your big man's had to come higher and higher up to the level of the screen, which creates an opening on that backside, right? And that's where the low man comes in. The guy that can tag the roller in pick and roll situations. Help at the rim in the event that your big man has to step up and help elsewhere, right? Cleaning up the defensive glass. Extra efforts when a guy pump fakes and gets the big man off the ground. That second wave is typically the low man. Rotating back out to the perimeter. You need an athlete that can bother things on the inside and then do you know two steps and a drop step and close out and get a good contest on a corner three-point shooter. These are all things that Siakam is going to be a massive, massive upgrade for this team. The entire physical profile of the team changes with this move. I I would presume they're, I mean, they might stay with Buddy Heald. Uh, it could be uh, Ben Matherin, but if it's Halliburton, and it ends up being something along the lines of like a Aaron Neesmith, Siakam, Turner front line, that just becomes way more physically imposing than what we've seen elsewhere this season, right? So like it just adds a new dynamic to the defensive physicality of the team. By the way, he's a great rebounder too. Averaged eight rebounds a game over the last five years, Pascal Siakam. And the Pacers are a bottom five defensive rebounding team this year. Siakam's also a very good offensive rebounder. So that'll help them on that end of the floor as well. But bottom line, it like fundamentally uh, uh, increases your physical profile on both ends of the floor. Improves your defensive rebounding, improves your rim protection and overall defensive capability, gives you an additional shot creator that can add some variety to what you do offensively, not to mention just making Tyrese Halliburton's job easier. And then in off-ball situations, he is a seamless fit with Tyrese Halliburton. Absolutely love the move. Didn't really have to give up anything of real consequence. Round of applause to the Pacers. Really, really well done. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if they're not done either. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if they look to shore up that two or that three spot before the deadline as well, although salary matching is a little tough there, so we'll see how that goes. On the Raptors front, they already have R.J. Barrett and Gary Trent Jr., who both, like, R.J. Barrett can play the three, can play the two, but to me, from a size perspective, and he's actually a pretty good point of attack defender, I look at him more as a two. Gary Trent Jr. is a decent point of attack defender, who's a pretty uh, uh, solid offensive player as well, so different archetype. Bruce Brown, Obviously different than both of them, but very good point of attack defender, a guy that can provide some rim pressure and transition, decent ball handler, really versatile kind of Swiss Army knife type of player. But they all kind of play that two, three hybrid type of spot, right? And so, although Gary Trent Jr. is more of a two. So the question is, is like at that point, do you want to have, you know, two of those guys making 20 plus million? You know what I mean? And especially if you don't plan on playing both of them together, Bruce is having a little bit of a down shooting year, and so is R.J. Barrett. So although he's been shooting really well with the Raptors, R.J. Barrett's been playing so well with the Raptors that they may kind of prioritize him. But point being, 
it might be that Bruce Brown is available now at the deadline in a way that he might not have been otherwise. If he was just on the Pacers, not sure the Pacers would have get, got rid of him, but they had to get rid of him to get Pascal Siakam. The Raptors might have more uh, uh, need for whatever they could get back from Bruce Brown than Bruce Brown himself. I personally, as someone who roots for the Lakers, would absolutely love to have Bruce Brown. D'Angelo Russell is a redundancy on the Lakers, but he's actually a good basketball player. He makes a, an affordable salary, makes less than $20 million a year, excellent passer, excellent off-ball shooter. He's a guy that could actually kind of connect, uh, uh, provide some connectivity and leadership for that Raptors team. I think, I think he's a, a I think D'Lo is very much a middle of the ground asset. Like he's a guy that like some teams would view as a negative asset and some teams would view as a positive asset, but only slightly so in either direction. And no one would really complain if he was in the trade, if they were getting something else it, that that's more of like the sweetener. Right. So like, what if the Lakers were to give him like, you know, D'Angelo Russell and Jalen Hood Shafino and Maxwell Lewis. That's like literally a first round pick from last year uh, who hasn't been able to play for the Lakers. Right. And then Maxwell Lewis, an interesting little undrafted guy, although I think he might have been a second-round pick, if I remember correctly. And then D'Lo, a veteran that could help. And maybe they throw in some second-round picks or something like that. Or maybe you did. Maybe if it push comes to shove and the Lakers really want him, they could throw in a first-round pick because they have one that they could trade. But Bruce Brown, to me, is a guy that like is a really useful playoff weapon. Specifically, the reason why I'd be so excited with him on the Lakers is he would just add an entire physical element to this team that they haven't had since Alex Caruso was on the roster. You can imagine a lineup that has an engaged LeBron James in his playoff mode with Anthony Davis and Bruce Brown on the floor just being so much more physically imposing than some of these lineups that we've seen from the Lakers this year. Um, although his shooting has been a little bit of an issue, which uh, I, I you know, obviously would be worried about a little bit for the Lakers' sake. But he did make a lot of threes in the postseason last year. But Lakers aren't the only team. There are a bunch of other teams that could potentially look at Bruce Brown as an option. Uh, he's going to be a little bit tough to match salaries into a Ford, especially if the Raptors want draft compensation. So it, it'll be interesting to see if any team gets in on that race. But he's a guy to keep an eye on. 